Now this is going to happen. You cannot buy or sell. What will you do? Are you going to take the mark of the beast so that you can buy milk for your baby and then hope that God understands? You know, let me tell you another truth. There are many, many people who are going to make that fatal mistake in that day, fooling themselves, deceiving themselves into thinking, God will understand. If I take the mark, he will understand me. He knows that I was forced to. He knows that I didn't want to, but I have to. The scriptures very clearly says in Revelation chapter 14, verses 9 to 11, Anyone who takes the mark of the beast will perish in hell forever and forever. The Lord Jesus said in Luke 23, 29, Blessed are the childless or those bearing women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Why? Because time will come that you and I cannot buy or sell without the mark of the beast. That's according to Revelation 13, 16 to 17. The question is, how are you going to feed your babies? Can you bear the scream of your baby? An adult like me I can bear the stomach pains or the hunger pains. Or if I choose to just take the water only to survive, yeah, I can do it. But how about to my baby, to my grandchild? Can I just bear? Can I just watch them dying because of hunger? The Lord Jesus said that Christians, His people, who are called by His name, should commit should be committed or be faithful to the end even to the point of death that's according to revelation chapter 2 verse 10 you cannot just be a learner in these last days anymore because the journey is going to begin when the journey is going to begin you must be a practitioner a practitioner who practices what you have been told, what you have been taught, and get ready for the journey. Without a covenant relationship with God, you cannot survive this last day's journey. It's not a covenant relationship with a ministry. Good for you to be in a covenant relationship as a partner with a church, as a ministry, all that is good. The pastors can pray for you. The ministers can pray for you. They can invite you to their conferences. All that is good. But at the end of the day, they are still men. Please keep that in mind. They are men prone to fall. Because it's still flesh, you know. As long as the flesh is flesh, they can fall. They are not infallible. But it's most important for you to have a covenant relationship with God. That is your only survival thing that will help you to survive in the last days. When everybody has forsaken you, only the Lord will be with you. So for Him to be with you, then you must have a strong covenant relationship with God. Everybody else can forsake you. The people whom you trust the most can let you down and you can be all alone. Now, what is covenant relationship? According to Webster, covenant means a promise, a pledge, agreement, a treaty or a compact. So this results to entering a kind of relationship which both parties agreed or promised to be faithful to each other. So what is being faithful? 
again, the Webster Dictionary says, being faithful is being committed. So both God and you and me will promise, do a promise to stay together until the end. So that's being a covenant relationship, a relationship being covenanted. And please listen. Is there any problem with God with faithfulness? I know and I know you know that God is forever faithful even when we are not. Read 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses 12 to 13. It says, If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are not faithful, he will still be faithful. For he can't, he can't deny himself. That's how faithful God is. He is so faithful and he is so good. This is why God says in Malachi chapter 2 verse 16, mm -hmm. I hate divorce. For when we separate ourselves from God and we decide to go on our direction, And that is committing divorce before God. Another question. Is there any problem with men when it comes to faithfulness? When it comes to commitment? The answer is yes. We always have problems with commitment, with faithfulness. According to Louisa May Alcott, human minds are more full of mysteries than any written book and more changeable than the cloud shapes in the air. Another quote from Mary Shelley, it says, Nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great and sudden change. And for the Bible perspective, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, friends, full of wonders, family, I am going to turn you over to Pastor Kevin Kinunes, the lead pastor of the Evangel Temple Church, Toronto, Canada. And this message, his message, is about commitment or faithfulness that will blow your mind. I'm sure it will blow your mind as it has blown mine. So remember, this is the most important virtue to have in order to survive. The last days without such commitment or faithfulness we will all end up taking the mark of the beast or worshiping the antichrist so starting today let's learn from this word let's learn faithfulness commitment stay tuned he says i am the vine you are the branches. And so, again, how many understand it's so important what we're connected to? And Jesus says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, I remain in you, you're going to bear much fruit. We, need, we want to be people who are bearing much fruit, good fruit at that. Apart from me, apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. 
And, I, and let me just say this morning, there are people in this building watching online that are at different places in their spiritual journey. There are those of you that have been serving God 40, 50 years. There are others of you that you've been serving God four or five minutes. Others of you, you're exploring, wondering you know, about God, wondering about what church is all about. And we welcome you to be a part of what God's doing here. And, and no matter where you're at on your spiritual journey, this is for you. Because this is an opportunity for all of us to develop in, in some of the great attributes of who God is. And today, like I said, we're talking about faithfulness. And, and you know, this morning, we, we, this weekend, we've been singing about faithfulness, and we've been singing about God's faithfulness. And, and as much as we know God is faithful, we're talking about what the Spirit of the Lord is developing in each and every one of us, right? What's happening on the inside of us, what God's doing inward, it begins to express itself on the outside of our lives. And so we're talking about your faithfulness, my faithfulness, and what is faithfulness. And, and, and again, we know God is faithful, right? Even when, when we're not, even when we are messing everything up, even when we're going in the wrong direction, God's still faithful. And the question is, are we faithful? And faithfulness is, it's basically commitment. It's commitment, being committed. It's also trustworthiness and reliability. Trustworthiness, can you trust somebody? Can you depend on them? And are you reliable? Are they reliable? How many know if you tell somebody you're gonna be somewhere at five o'clock, you, you need to be there a few minutes before five o'clock? Because that's reliability, that's faithfulness, that's commitment, that's being committed. And the reliability, trustworthiness, the reality is we're all committed to something or some things, what are we committed to? Many of us, we're committed to political parties. We're committed to saving the trees. We're committed to, you know, natural environmental issues. And, and we're committed to our wives, our husbands. We're committed to our children. And those are good things to be committed to. There's nothing wrong with being committed to things out here in our world. There's nothing wrong. How many know it's a good thing to be committed to your spouse? It's a good thing to be committed to your kids. But the number one commitment that each and every one of us should have in our lives is our commitment to Jesus. Because it's that commitment that should lead every other commitment in our lives. It's when we're committed to Jesus that we begin to care about the things of the world that actually really matter to him and to his heart as well. Amen? And how many understand it, it, it evolves around people in so many ways? Now look, I've said it each and every week throughout this series, we, none of us, we are perfect. None of us have arrived. None of us have got it all figured out. And uh, even on the, the faithful aspect of things, I, I do not have it figured out. I am not perfected in that area. I have not just achieved you know, 100% success rate in that. But I strive to continue to do better with the help of God and the help of his spirit working in my life. And, and you know, if you are one of those individuals who think that you've got one of these fruit figured out and you are perfected in it, you probably are way worse than most of us then. Because the reality is none of us have it all figured out. None of us have it perfected. And, 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 and again, you know, as a, as a pastor, there's one promise, one guarantee that I give, and I've given it for years as a, as a pastor, one promise I give to the people of, of the church, always. One guarantee. If you want to know what that one guarantee is, I want you to write it down. Maybe you're new, you haven't heard me say it yet, but I want to give you my one pastoral guarantee, the one commitment that I will make to you as a pastor. You all ready? Write it down this way. When, 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 you, when you see it happen, you'll be like, oh my gosh, I remember him saying that. So here's the one guarantee, the one commitment that I can make to you as your pastor. It's the only commitment that I've ever guaranteed and ever made in all of my years, over 19 years of, of pastoral ministry. You ready for it? Here it is. My one guarantee, my one commitment is that eventually I will let you down. I know we laugh at that, but that, and, and, you see, and others are like shocked, like, what is he, he's going to let me down? Yes. Why? Because I am just as human and fallible as each and every one of you. And just like you're going to let the person next to you down at some point, and you're going to maybe let me down at some point, I, I promise you, I will at some point in time, I will let you down. Because I'm human, and I'm not perfect. And even in these fruit of the Spirit, I've not perfected any one of these nine, but I strive to continue to grow, and I strive to continue to do better so that I can be better, and I can be a better husband, a better father, a better pastor, a better person, a better human being. How many know we need some better human beings in our world, amen? 
And so again, we're, it's about commitment. What are we committed to? Now we understand commitment, right? Or the lack there of an image. We're going to throw it up on the, on the screen here real quick. It's a quote by uh, Mother Teresa. And I understand we're not Catholic, but she said a lot of great things, all right? But Mother Teresa said, God has not called me to be successful. He has called me to be faithful. How I many of that's a good word for Mother Teresa right there, amen? And, and here's a woman who gave of herself and gave her life to people, to the work of God. But she said, God has not called me to be successful He has called me, can I tell you, he has called each and every one of us to be committed, to be faithful in every area of our lives. And now we understand that God is faithful, but humanity has not always been committed and faithful to God. Now, I want to look in real quick, Hosea. Now, Hosea is is a minor prophet, an Old Testament prophet. He was the mouthpiece of God to his generation, to people in his time. Now, God, in this season of time, people were unfaithful to God. And so he wanted for Hosea as his prophet, as his voice to the generation, because how many know God speaks through people, right? And so, so he wanted Hosea to understand what God was feeling as a result of the unfaithfulness of people. And so I want you to look with me in Hosea 1, verse 2. It says, uh, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, he's like, I want you to know what I feel. And he, he says, the Lord said to him, go marry a promiscuous woman, have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Now, can I tell you the NIV version is being very, very nice to this woman. Her name was Gomer, all right? And when when it, it describes her as a promiscuous woman, the NIV is being very, very kind to her because basically she was a prostitute. But here he is, and the Lord says, I want you to go marry this promiscuous woman. I want you to have children with her. And you are going to experience the unfaithfulness of this woman, the pain, the agony, the hurt. How many understand when we're not committed to God, to his purpose in our lives, he is hurt by that. He is, the Bible says he's a jealous God. And so he wants commitment from you and from me to his plan for our lives. Now, again, doesn't mean we're not going to miss the mark sometimes. Doesn't mean we're not going to mess up sometimes. Doesn't mean, because again, God's not looking for you to be perfect because Jesus, who is in us, is perfect. And, and so he's not looking for you to be perfect in all your ways, but he's looking for you to be committed to the plan and to the work of God. There's three components of commitment I want to discuss with you this morning. And the first one is being committed to God. How many understand we have got to be committed to God? First, above all else, our commitment must be to God. Again, we can be committed to a lot of things. I'm committed to my wife. She's committed to me. But I want her number one commitment not to be to me, but to be to God. Because if she's committed to God, she's going to be a better wife for me. In Romans, I want you to uh, look with me, Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, and in verse 18, against all hope. Anybody ever feel like there was no hope and everything was against you and there was no alternative way, there was nothing you could do, you thought you had an answer, but nothing was working out, and against all hope. So against all hope, Abraham, in hope, because how many know we can still hope in the middle of hopeless situations, right? Right? Against all hope, Abraham, in hope, he believed. And because he believed, he was committed, and so he became the father of many nations. And just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, without weakening in his commitment, without weakening in his belief, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old. Let me stop there for a moment, all right? He's 100 years old. Sarah's 90 some odd years old. Now, again, think about that. How many understand biology and how biology works? 190 year old people, they are not supposed to have kids. I mean, you're not supposed to get pregnant in your 90s. How many understand that is a, a literal miracle? Now, could you imagine but against everything. So, he, you know, he realized his body was, was weakening in his face. Uh, you know, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. And since he was about 100 years old and Sarah's uh, womb was also dead. Verse 20, look here. Yet he did not waver through unbelief. 
regarding the promise of God. He didn't waver in what God had spoken. He didn't waver in what God had said regarding the promise that God had given. But he was strengthened in his faith, and he gave glory to God. Being fully persuaded, how many know we need to be fully persuaded in who God is, persuaded in the word of God, persuaded in the promise of God for our lives, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. And this is why it was credited to him as righteousness. And so we have a commitment to God and a commitment to his promise and a commitment to his word because we know that even when we don't have the answers and we don't have the direction and we don't know the way to go and we don't know what to do, we know that God is faithful to everything he has spoken, to everything he has said, to everything he has promised. And so we ought to hold on to him. And it's about being committed to God. And so again, what are you committed to? You know, I, I make plans and I, you know, and again, I, I, I believe in making plans. But my commitment isn't to my plan. My commitment has to be to his plan. And again, we've got to prioritize what it is we are genuinely committed to. So number one is about being committed to God. Number two is being committed to people. Now, I could pause there, and, and, and I, could have, I could have phrased it and said, you know, it's about being committed to the church. But I think sometimes when we say, you know, we need to be committed to the church, we have a misconception of what that means. We sometimes think that means I'm committed to the organization, to the entity that would be evangel or whatever church somebody's attending, and we think, well, I'm committed to that church. And, and again, as members of a church, local church, we want people to be committed. We're not saying don't be committed to the church, but when we say it's about being committed to the church, it's about being committed to people ultimately because people are the church, the building, the entity, the organization, the, the business. That's not the church. That's not the church. You, we, me, I'm part of it. We are the church. People are the church. And can I tell you something? The people that are yet in the church are part of the, should be part of the church in our viewpoint. And so again, we're, we're committed to people. And, and I want you to look with me, Matthew chapter 22. And we, we looked at the scripture earlier on in this series, and especially as it pertained to the subject of love in week one. But it says in verse 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. All right, so love God, love him. And Jesus is speaking here. He's saying, love God with everything that's in you, with all of your being, with all of your existence, your heart, your soul, your mind, everything, love your God. This is the first, and it is the greatest of all the commandments. And then he says, and the second is, is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. You know, when, when, again, I don't think it's by chance or accident that the very first fruit of the Spirit that's listed out is that of love, because we are called to live and called to operate in love to everything and to everyone. So we're to love God first, but then we're to love our neighbor as we love our, so who's your neighbor? And again, we've discussed this, but, but everybody you come into contact with, if you took an Uber to church this morning and you're gonna leave by Uber, that driver, that is your neighbor and you're to love them. The person you walk down by the street is your neighbor and you are to love them. The person you're sitting next to or social distance from on the subway, they are your neighbor and you are to love them. But love your neighbor as you love yourself. So everyone you come into contact with is your people you go to work with that frustrate you. They are your neighbor and you are to love them. But here's the problem. What we looked at in week one is oftentimes there are some of us, some of us who think a little bit too much of ourselves. And then there are others of us, we don't love ourselves enough. Because, and again, in the middle of COVID and everything that's going on in our world and people who already struggle with loving themselves enough, can I tell you, we see it even growing and the lack of confidence and love and in the midst of isolation. And we are dealing with isolation in our culture and our world today. But can I tell you something? It doesn't matter who you are and it doesn't matter. God loves you and we love you. You are loved. You are loved. It doesn't matter. Pastor, you don't even know me. It doesn't matter. I love you. I can't even see the fullness of everybody. I, I, I can only see a fourth of your face, but I can tell you, I love you. 
There's something that God puts inside of people that causes you to love people, people you don't even know, people you don't even know their names. And there's some of you that I know really, really well. Others I know you, you know, somewhat. And others of you, I don't know you at all. You don't know me, but I love you. And can I tell you, God loves you. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or who you've done it with. God loves you right where you are. God loves you. And we love you. We love you. And we are to love people. Because if we don't love people, we won't love people to a relationship with God. How many understand we've got to be committed to connecting people to God? And so when you look at the first two points, right, it's about a commitment to God and a commitment to people. There's an order in the way in which it goes. We've got to be committed to God, but then we must be committed to people right there under that. I want you to look at me in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Hebrews 10 and verse 24 says, and let us consider how we may spur, which is to encourage and push people forward, not physically, all right, uh, but, but encourage people with our words, our actions, our deeds. But, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and towards good deeds. How we can love people and we can serve people. So we've got to consider as individuals, how can I be committed to people to encourage them? And, and let me give you a couple of ways that you can show a greater level of commitment to people. Take a next step. Maybe get involved in a men's Bible study, a woman's Bible study, one of our e-life groups. And so get involved in a small group setting where you can encourage one another, develop one another, push one another forward in the things of God and draw people into a greater level of, of, of commitment and relationship with God. That's why, why small groups and smaller settings are so much better in some ways than the public setting of the weekend. Because in those smaller settings, we can really dive in with one another and really encourage one another to grow and to go further and to be more committed and to do greater things and to do more for God. One of the things I, you know, and again, you know, we all have different opinions and different thoughts and different thinking, but, you know, one of the, th the things that I've always, you know, encouraged throughout all of my years of ministry is, you know, when somebody gives their life to Jesus and they, 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 they have that new relationship, number one, let's get them baptized. Let's get them baptized in water, right, so that they can do what God told them to do. And then number two, let's get them serving people. Oh, but pastor, they got to be saved for a year before that. No, they, my goodness, What? I want everybody who has a relationship with the Lord, I, you know, and I, even, you know, one of the things is this, you know, because, because people who begin to serve begin to go deeper with God. People who begin to serve other people begin to encounter God's power, God's work, God's love in their life. And so, you know, we're oftentimes so, so hesitant to let people because of their past and because of whatever issues, you know, and look, can I tell you something? None of us are worthy to be doing anything that we do for God. None of us deserve, to, I don't deserve to be up here speaking to each and every one of you today. Those of you online, I don't deserve to speak to you. I don't deserve anything. But God saw me as somebody who was willing, and he said, sure, I'll let this dude, I'll let this guy get up and talk in front of people and speak my word, and, and I'm still trying to figure that one out. Some of you are wondering, you're like, I'm trying to figure that out too. How did that happen? No. But we got to be committed to God. We got to be committed to people. Number three, and, and this is what I want you to get hold of, we have to be committed to an eternal view. Committed to an eternal view. What does that mean, Pastor? To be committed to an eternal, so committed to God, committed to people, committed to an eternal view. And, and let me tell you, there's an order to this, right? Because we're committed to God, helps us to be more loving to people, committed to people, but then we're committed to an eternal view. It means we don't just look at the world around us as the world around us. We begin to see the way God sees things, everything with a spiritual context of eternity at mind and about drawing people into relationship with God and bringing people into a connection with God because that's what what really matters in the end. That's what really matters in the end, is connecting people to God, bringing people into a relationship. So does the world around you and I, do they see us? Do they see the church? Do they see the building as, you know, or do they see Jesus in us? And then when they look at the church, do they see, you know, in people, do they see the church as trustworthy or even reliable? 
You know, oftentimes we love to go into the streets and do ministry so that we can sometimes pat ourselves on the back and say, wow, we did a good job. Look at what we've done. Look how cool we are. Look how good we are. Look how much we do for Jesus. But reliability to the community with an eternal view is we don't just come and do one thing and then say, whoop, pat myself on the back. Look, we showed up. We did a thing. No, we keep coming back again and again and again and again and again. And we continue to serve and we continue to love people right where they are. Why? Why? Because we're faithful and we're committed. And again, it's not about making us feel good, patting ourselves on the back and patting each other on the back saying, "Woo, thanks for coming. You're awesome. You did great. You went on a missions trip. You went and fed the homeless. You did all these, whatever. No, it's about coming back again and again, building a relationship because we want to lead people into a connection with God. I want you to look at me, James chapter two real quick. James chapter two, and I want you to look at verse 14. It says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deed? Right, so they claim, I am a man of faith, a woman of faith. Who I'll lay hands on everybody and they're gonna recover because I am a person of faith. But you have no deeds. You know, remember in week one when we were talking about love and we were saying, you know, basically you can have all the spiritual gifts in the world, but if you do not have love, It doesn't matter how much you say and how much you talk. It's like a clanging symbol. Basically, it's annoying. And so there's a lot of us, we claim to have great faith, but our deeds are lacking. And then it says, and there's a question, can such faith save them? And I want you to look at verse 15 here with me. I want you to this, get a hold of this in your heart right here. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes or daily food. Pause there for a moment. So, so somebody, a brother, a sister, whether in the church or even on the outside of a church, they are without clothes and they are without food to eat. What do we do? What, 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 look at verse 16 here. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed. We in the church, we, and again, I'm not saying that this is an issue here or anything, but in the church on a whole, okay? We, we have an issue. We, we walk by people all the time. We're like, hey, how's it going? And we don't really care how they're doing. How are you today? How are you doing? We ask these questions and we expect the typical basic response of good, well, okay, doing fine, doing pretty good. I'm okay, a little tired, but good. You know, we expect the basic response. So so oftentimes we ask the question while we're still moving away from the person without really engaging to hear what it is that they have to say. And then somebody's like, I'm not doing too good. We sometimes don't even hear it. And then when we do, we're like, oh, what what, what do I do? And those are the moments and the times and the opportunities that we have to stop where we are to love that person right where they are. But but think about this. If somebody comes up to you today and is like, I I have no clothes, I have no food. I mean, what what do we do? What are we going to do? Are we just going to say, well, God bless you. I'm going to be praying for you. Woo! Lord, bless them, give them some clothes so they don't go around naked. Lord, give them some food so they can be fed. Lord, bless, you know, I mean, is that all we're, is that where we're going to stop? I mean, I, 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 I saw on social media this week a story, and I don't know if it was in Canada or in the States, and it was in North America, but somebody, a, a woman was in one of these dollar stores, and the police were called on her for stealing, for theft. And the police officer shows up, he arrives, and he's talking to the woman. He says, ma'am, what, what were you taking? And she said, I took five eggs to feed my children. Now, he had a decision to make. Does he charge her for stealing five eggs? Or does he say, oh, he didn't charge her. He didn't charge her. No, he, 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 he instead went back into the store and bought tons of groceries out of his own money and deliver them to her home to feed her and her children. How many understand sometimes what's right isn't necessarily what's what's lawful? Because lawful would have been, you know, charge her and do whatever he does. But what was right in this situation was to make sure her and her children were going to be fed. Because if anybody is so desperate enough to have to go steal five eggs, that's desperation. And the problem is, and I don't know if this was a man who loved God and served God or not, but the problem is that the world is outdoing the church in many ways when it comes to deeds. We can talk faith really good as the church, but our deeds are oftentimes lacking. 
But man, the world is out loving the world. That's a problem. That's a problem. So, so you know, we oftentimes look at people and, and we say, well, you know, God bless you. I'm going to be praying for you. When we have an opportunity to meet a need right there in the moment. I want you to look in verse 17 in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So it's not enough to just say, I believe and offer some prayers. There's got to be some physical component of touch that's going on with it as well. Look, if I have a neighbor that is going hungry with children, I'm going to do, I don't care what I need to do, I'm going to make sure that they're going to be fed. I'm not going to let people in my community, in my neighborhood, people that I talk to go hungry. And can I tell you today, if you are going physically hungry, I'm not even talking about spiritual hunger right now. I'm talking about physical hungry. If you are physically hungry, you have children, you are by yourself, you are a senior, you are anybody, I don't care. If you say, I don't have enough food in the cupboards, you let me know and we will make sure we take care of that today. In verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds. Show me your faith without any action. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. Can I tell you, we don't need to tell the world we are people of faith, no. We don't need to tell people we are faithful and committed to God. No, our deeds will show the world that we serve God and we love God. And because we love God, we love people. That's faithful. That's committed. Stand with me all across the building. Lord, I thank you. Praise God. Aren't you glad for his faithfulness in your life? And today, it's an opportunity, it's a time for us to evaluate our commitment to God, our commitment to people, and our commitment to an eternal view. So Lord, I pray. Would you just lift your hands? I want to pray for you right now. Father, I pray. I pray that right now, God, that our commitment would rise. Our commitment to you, to people, to the world around us, to an eternal view that God, you would place a desire in each and every one of us to serve like we have never served before, to love like we have never loved before. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for that, God. We're gonna take just a few moments. Jackie's just gonna lead us and it's an opportunity, a time for each and every one of us just to, just to connect with God right where we are, just to connect with God. We're just going to worship a little longer. And it's an opportunity for you just to hear, listen to what God wants to say to you, to talk to the Lord, but connect with God right here in these few moments. And so Jack is going to lead us, and then Pastor Paul is going to come and close out the service. But let's just connect with the Lord here for the next few moments.
So I encourage you all to go to this church and worship God and see Pastor Kevin. As part of the city and the provincial government's mandate to, to ensure safety. So the church services are spread over on Saturdays 5 p.m., Sundays 9.30 a.m. and 11.30 a.m. So for some reasons you cannot attend due to distance. So you're so welcome to join the live streaming. So each service has a live stream, so please try. Good Wonders family, again, thank you so much. Thank you for your support. Thank you for watching all our videos, sharing all of them, subscribing us, asking other people, your friends, relatives to subscribe us. Thank you so much to, uh, to watch our videos. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. So please keep praying for us as we keep praying for you. Every day we keep praying for you. Thank you so much. So we will journey together in these last days. To God be the glory. God bless you all.